I ask uh, unanimous consent to speak as if in morning business for up to, I guess, 17 minutes. Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, with the Republican plan to defeat the Affordable Care Act itself defeated, President Trump says he wants to move beyond health care to focus on other priorities. One area that he has often highlighted is our nation's crumbling infrastructure, which is a priority that many of us share and something I'd like to discuss today. Now, all of our kids, Mr. President, I suspect dread having to bring home a lousy report card. Uh, they'd be facing a serious talk. Every four years, the American Society of Civil Engineers issues a report card for American infrastructure. Our 2017 report card out just this month shows lousy marks across the board for American infrastructure. Our ports and bridges got C pluses. Flat Ds for both drinking water infrastructure and roads. And our energy grid got a D plus. Overall, the United States took home a D plus grade point average. Not pretty. And not an improvement over the scores that we got four years earlier. A report card is a progress report, and our grades show we're not making progress. So it's time to get serious about the sorry state of America's roads, bridges, ports, and pipes, which literally keep our economy moving. The civil engineers estimate that we need an additional $2 trillion in infrastructure investments over the next 10 years to get our infrastructure back to a B grade level. The study also found that there's a cost for lousy infrastructure that we're set to lose nearly $4 trillion in GDP and $7 trillion in lost business sales by 2025, which would result in 2.5 million fewer jobs that year. Our declining American infrastructure also faces growing demand. The Bipartisan Policy Center estimates an additional 100 million more people will rely on our transportation system by mid-century. The U.S. Department of Transportation says that we can expect twice the level of freight traffic on our highways and roads by then. So our already worn down infrastructure is going to take an even heavier beating. We've got to be ready for this. We've got to make smart investments in the infrastructure backbone of American commerce. We should make those investments now, and we should make them for the long term. I am hopeful. Transportation infrastructure has been a rare bipartisan bright spot in Congress. After all, our red states and our blue states both have bridges that age and water mains that rupture. Congress has tried many times to push large bipartisan infrastructure bills. In the 112th Congress, a bipartisan group led by Senators Kerry, Graham, and Hutchison introduced the BUILD Act to create a national infrastructure bank that would have authorized up to $10 billion to underwrite transportation, water, and energy projects. The Partnership to Build America Act, introduced in the 113th Congress by Senators Bennett and Blunt, also proposed an American infrastructure fund, this time financed with a form of tax repatriation. In the 114th Congress, we were actually able to pass the first long-term transportation law in 10 years. The FAST Act, short for Fixing America's Surface Transportation, authorized more than $300 billion in transportation infrastructure investment over a five-year period. We also passed the Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation Act to address drinking water emergencies and authorized a number of new Army Corps of Engineer projects, including the removal of pilings and other marine debris from the Providence River in Rhode Island. These bipartisan successes, however, barely put a dent in our nation's total infrastructure needs. Out on the campaign trail, then-candidate Donald Trump spoke broadly of a trillion-dollar infrastructure push. I agree, we've got to make that investment in America's infrastructure. But we also need to make sure that we get real commitment from Washington, not just private-public partnerships and nebulous tax cuts. 
To bring our roads and bridges into the 21st century, we need a far-reaching infrastructure program like President Franklin Roosevelt's Works Progress Administration. The Joint Economic Committee's Democratic Contingent put out a report analyzing the President's proposal to use investor tax credits to close our infrastructure gap. What they found? Using these tax credits alone would actually, and I quote here, cost nearly 55 percent more than traditional infrastructure financing. We can't let infrastructure turn into a special interest boondoggle. In the absence of any sort of executive plan or strategy, Senate Democrats, led by Minority Leader Schumer, put forward our own blueprint to rebuild America's infrastructure. It would invest a trillion dollars in the nation's infrastructure, as the President wished, creating over 15 million American jobs. The blueprint encompasses not just roads and bridges, but parks and schools, hospitals and airports. It calls for investing $100 billion into small-town communities that need revamped infrastructure, over $100 billion into aging water and sewer systems, $50 billion into our railways, over $100 billion into public transportation, and $30 billion into our essential port infrastructure. It would put billions towards modernizing our energy grid by connecting rural areas and driving investment in clean energy. It includes strong support for American workers, something that the President claims as a priority, with Buy America provisions to promote American-made products and protections like Davis-Bacon to ensure that Americans earn fair wages. For a coastal state like Rhode Island, which has to prepare for rising seas and increased storm surges from climate change, the blueprint includes $25 billion to improve coastal infrastructure and make coastal communities more resilient. This includes competitive, critical infrastructure resiliency funding, a new Resilient Communities Revolving Loan Fund, and support for the National Oceans and Coastal Security Fund, which I authored some time ago to research, restore, and reinforce our costs. Our plan is big, and it is bold, and it should garner the support of anyone who says they want to improve America's infrastructure and create jobs at home. This work is vitally important in my home state. The American Society of Civil Engineers report card shines a light on Rhode Island's particular infrastructure woes. It shows we need $148 million in drinking water infrastructure needs and nearly $2 billion in wastewater infrastructure fixes over the next 20 years. We have $4.7 million of backlogged park system repairs and a $241 million gap in needed upgrades at schools. More than half of our roads are in poor condition. A lot of our infrastructure, unlike uh, Alaska, Mr. President, dates back to colonial days. And the foundations of our roads were first traveled by ox carts. This state of disrepair costs my constituents a lot of money. I've been told by the transportation research group, TRIP, that driving on cracked and crumbling roads in Rhode Island costs our motorists $604 million per year, more than $810 per motorist per year in vehicle repair and operating costs from banging into potholes. In our state, 56 percent of the bridges are deficient or obsolete. That, I'm sorry to say, is the worst rate in the country. These bridges have been around a long time in many cases, and they're literally falling down piece by piece. It can be pretty shocking to see. This is part of the 610 connector in Providence. That interchange is the vital link in the state's highway network for vehicles traveling between interstates 95, 195, and 295. It was built in stages through the 1950s, and it can no longer accommodate the approximately 100,000 automobiles and heavy trucks that travel on it each day. Our Department of Transportation has spent millions of dollars on temporary maintenance to keep the interchange shored up and in operation. But you can see that this type of jury rigging is not a lasting situ um, solution. While Rhode Island directs millions of state funds to the repair and replacement of these structures, 
We need some federal financing to, to ensure that this work gets done before a serious failure occurs, which could disrupt commerce up and down the entire Northeast Corridor. The evidence of dangerous disrepair is all over my state. Here is a crumbling bridge on Route 37, the east-west freeway servicing the cities of Cranston and Warwick. The tumble-down cement and rusting ironwork are not reassuring. Here's another rusted and ramshackle bridge over Highway 95. We can save money in the long term, Mr. President. A stitch in time saves nine if we can get onto these repairs and get these bridges fixed. We also have to consider the bridges, roads, ports, rails, and other transit systems in the ocean state that are, as you might imagine, very close to our coast. This infrastructure is at particular risk from sea level rise, from storm surge, and from the more severe storms that come at us offshore driven by warming seas and climate change. Recently, NOAA released updated global sea level rise estimates, and they focused those global estimates onto the U.S. coastline. The estimate for their extreme scenario, that is, if we continue to emit high levels of carbon pollution, was increased by half a meter to a total of 2.5 meters, or over eight feet of global mean sea level rise by 2100. My state's Coastal Resources Management Council has adopted the high scenario for coastal planning purposes and made the adjustments for the local conditions, and they now put nine vertical feet of sea level rise as the expectation for Rhode Island's coast by 2100. And of course, as any coastal senator knows, when you go straight up nine feet, you can go a long way back, pushing the shoreline uh, into what is now inland. Flooding a lot, of course, of infrastructure. So we need to protect evacuation routes from flooding. We need to bolster hurricane barriers. We need to replenish beaches and nourish wetlands that protect infrastructure from storm. We need to raise ports and reinforce bridges that are exposed to corrosive salt water and to storms. We need to manage upstream reservoirs to control downstream flooding. We need to protect underground drinking water supplies from intruding salt water. We need to retrofit lowland wastewater treatment plants that are in danger of flooding. Some of ours aren't just in flood zones, Mr. President. They're actually in velocity zones where wave action is expected against the structures. These improvements are essential to meeting our infrastructure needs over the coming decades. Every coastal state, especially those in the Northeast and the Western Gulf of Mexico, which are expected to see the most dramatic rises in sea level, should be nervous. And that's why the Democratic Infrastructure Blueprint includes funding for resilient coastal communities, including support for that National Oceans and Coastal Security Fund. I've worked to establish this lifeline for coastal infrastructure since my early days in the Senate. Once we fund it, it can be a tremendous resource for coastal communities needing infrastructure improvement and smart coastal adaptation. President Trump has said he wants a trillion dollar infrastructure bill. I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and get her done. Democrats have put forward a blueprint for making the investments that our nation so badly needs. Congress can come together on a plan that will provide direct long-term support and help communities address current needs while also preparing for the changes we know are coming down the pipeline at us. I say to my Senate colleagues and to the administration, let's get to work. I yield the floor.